So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to our Traverse PC March webinar. Today we'll be talking about coordinates reference system CRS part one. Uh, I've labeled it uh, combining terrestrial and GNSS survey data in your surveys, but really we're going to cast a pretty wide net today and um, give you some background on how we put all this together inside of Traverse PC. And I am pretty sure we're going to extend this topic on into April and uh, maybe even into May. At the end of the webinar, I'll um, direct you to uh, fill out some information about what else you might like to, to look at related to uh, this topic. And we'll make sure we get that covered for you. I'm going to open up the uh, member area in Traverse PC. So if you are uh, signed up, registered on our website, you have access to the member area. And I'm interested in this Learning Center link here. But when I open up the Learning Center, I'm going to find lots of online resources for Traverse PC. And we're going to hang out here today, particularly in coordinate reference systems, a little bit in calibrations, uh, maybe a little bit in geodetics and transformations. So we're actually going to touch on a number of these. But this learning center is where you come 24-7 to access the printed learning guides, to uh, look at recorded webinars, help topics, sample surveys. I mean, it's all here. People use this a lot, and we're real glad that we've got this resource for you. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to drop into the coordinate reference system, and members have access to a quick video, maybe a learning guide, or some help topics on it. If you're a Traverse BC customer, you can take a deeper dive though, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to drop down in here and take a look at coordinate reference systems. And I just want to start with this uh, introduction here and give us a feel for kind of what we're looking at today. Each survey has a coordinate reference system, a CRS, which determines the relationship between geographic coordinates, latitude and longitude, and rectangular coordinates, X and Y. The CRS uses an ellipsoid, that's a mathematical representation of the Earth, a horizontal datum to reference geodetic to rectangular coordinates, a vertical datum, okay, and a map projection to convert the Earth's spherical, spherical surface to a flat surface. So TPC will sometimes refer, refer to the rectangular coordinate system of a CRS as the grid, um, but all rectangular coordinates are assumed to lie on the grid. So an inverse between two points is a grid inverse, and TPC does most of its computations with regular coordinates and displays the equivalent geodetic coordinates based on the CRS. So just a little kind of uh, heads up about what this is about. And then if we drop down, we have uh, whole sections here that cover areas of the CRS. So we're going to be taking a look at one of these a little bit later on. Uh, and then I have access to all of the other um, topics in here. So we're going to be looking at calibrations also. So I can drop in and take a look at calibrations and I have the same format, that introduction, video, and then I can choose from any number of topics here. Um, we're going to be taking a look at the um, site calibrations here in ju just a moment. So I want you to know how this works and how you access this. Now one little note, um, if you purchase Traverse PC, you become a customer automatically on our website and you have access to all that data. If you're working for an organization where you're not managing the license but you're using Traverse PC, you can become a customer. And a real easy way to do it is go to help, bring up the support page for the version of Traverse PC you're working on, and uh, every support page has an opportunity right here for you to register as a customer. I'm already logged in so it just shows me my information and shows my membership level as customer. So if you're not a customer, fill out this registration and you'll become a customer and then you'll have access to this um, level here in the um, Learning Center. So let's come back to our outline here and get started. I'll refer back to this um, yeah, with each section here so we can kind of follow along and you know where we're going. Now I mentioned um, I'm going to cast a pretty wide net today as we talk about coordinate reference systems and kind of the components there. We're really just going to kind of introduce you to the pieces today. And um, I'm pretty sure you're going to say, 
oh, I'd like to know about this or I'd like to know about that. When you fill out your uh, CEU request, go ahead and kind of tell us what you'd like to take a look at next. I've already sort of temporarily filled in some topics for April, grid to ground, project location, COGO and reports, and then uh, in May, calibrations and best practices as kind of a follow-up to this. But uh, we'll kind of take your direction with the things that you ask for and at least do those in April and then we'll see whether or not we have this flow over into the May webinar as well. Okay, <clears throat> because this is such a big project, um, I like to start with a practical example. And um, I remember as a student taking fluid mechanics, um, uh, a guy named uh, Euler, a French mathematician, kind of took calculus and stood it on its head and instead of integrating over an, an area or a surface, he cut a window in a pipe and as the water flowed by, he integrated the flow over time. And it was kind of a, a difficult concept to grasp. So we spent the first half of the term in the lab at the water tables and uh, watching how fluids work. And we, we worked on what we called a concrete learning before we switched over to the abstract learning. And I don't think I ever would have gotten it if we hadn't spent that time in, in the lab to begin with. So what I want to do is start with a practical example so you can kind of see some of these things being put together and have an idea of where we're going with this. So I'm going to go back to our uh, calibration um, learning center and let's drop into this site calibration. And I don't I don't always do this but I'm going to play this video for you because it'll zoom in you can see things better and, and here's what I want you to do kind of your assignment here I want you to listen for the terms so local grid um, geodetic latitude longitude grid versus ground CRS or coordinate reference system grid coordinates local coordinates GNSS that sort of thing and just kind of let your ears pick up on the different pieces that are going into this and it'll give you an opportunity then to uh, kind of see this in action a little bit and we'll come back and talk about it. So let's go ahead and um, listen to this video now. Welcome to the TPC desktop video series. In this video we're going to take a look at site calibration, a feature that's new in TPC desktop 2019. Um, I'm going to work on a, a project that I was asked to help with. This is uh, Wohink Lake just south of Florence here and uh, the water district was looking at tapping some new uh, main lines into the lake, bringing them out to the county road and then down to a processing facility. Uh, one of the locations we looked at was right here, uh, up this little bit drainage uh, next to where these lots are cleared uh, and then hitting the road. The other was uh, down here, uh, accessing the lake in this cove, again, coming up this drainage and accessing the county road out here. And I want to kind of walk you through the process of, of taking a look at this this piece here. And you can see there's a little bit of a relief here, a little bit of, for that drainage there. Um, I'm going to bring up Traverse PC. We did surveys years ago um, out on some of these lots and um, we had that file in what we'd call local site coordinates, ground coordinates. Uh, the, I think these start at zero, zero. But the Google Earth is at state plane or geodetic positions. So we need to Put the two together and we're going to do that with the site calibration. So I'm using this Google Earth planning project. You could use any GPS or GNSS project and go through the same steps. So what I did, I got out some surveys and kind of picked up these three locations of where I thought lot corners would be inside Google Earth because I want to start with Google Earth positions. And I put those in this uh, folder here or this file called TL300KMZ. So let's go ahead and save that to our folder and let us, then let's go into Traverse PC and bring that in. So I'm going to tell Traverse PC I want to go to File, Import, and I'm going to browse to that file folder, pull in that file, and import it. Okay. Now, when I imported it, Traverse PC said, I'm going to go to the coordinate reference system that you've selected here. In this case, NEV 83, and we're using the Oregon South. And I'm going to use this uh, projection information 
to generate plane coordinates out of those geodetic positions. So that's what Traverse PC has done, and those points have geodetic positions. Let's go ahead and open up that Traverse. And I'm just going to tell it how I want it to draw it here. And I can see then that I've got geodetic positions and state plane coordinates for those points. Now, I did something interesting in uh, Google Earth. I can do this with any data collector. I said this KML 876 geodetic point is the same as number four. So the, the pound is just a character that says, I'm, that creates a reference to point four. And point four here, it's this monument at the northwest corner of lot 300. I did the same for the monument at one and the same for the monument at two. And those are the three points I'm gonna use then to calibrate the geodetic positions to my local site. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's choose tools, calibrate, create calibration. And I'm gonna choose this middle option that says select a traverse of uncalibrated points with calibrated points as, they can be side shots or they can be in the description with whatever character you wanna use. We don't care what you use. And that's the option I've chosen here. I'm gonna select the traverse that I've imported and choose okay. And Traverse PC is going to go ahead and create that calibration. So I'm going to call this Google Earth. I'm going to bring in the file name so I have a reference of where it came from. I'm going to tell Traverse PC that we're going to use the um, coordinate reference system as the system we're coming from. And I'm going to go to site. Now you can type whatever you want in here. These pull downs just make it a little faster. And then I'm going to save this in the project folder as my Google Earth calibration. Call it whatever you want, just reference. And and I'm happy with these residuals. Remember, I'm just picking these off uh, Google Earth, so I actually got pretty lucky with these. And I can always come back later, occupy those monuments or other monuments, and recreate a better, more precise calibration. But this is good enough for what I want to do right now. OK. Now. <sighs> If I were to go ahead and plot these points that I just created a calibration for, um, I'm going to get this. Here are my local site coordinates at zero, 00. Here are my state plane coordinates um, at million plus kind of thing. Well, I don't want to mess with I want to put everything on the same site. And I do that then through the site calibration. So I'm going to go back to the survey information. I'm going to bring up the site calibration tab, and I'm going to tell Traverse PC, I want to go in and get that calibration I just created. So here's that Google Earth calibration. Make sure it can bring it in OK. Yeah, there we go. And here's all the information I just put in about it. And then I'm simply going to say calibrate points. OK, as soon as I do that, Traverse PC now is able to come in and replot those points. Uh, where they belong in the local site. So I'm going to zoom in here. And you see in green how it's plotted these right over the top of the uh, monuments. So the site calibration then has given these geodetic positions local site coordinates. And in fact, that's what I'm looking at in the tooltip. The uh, Y, X, and Z values there are local site coordinates, but right beneath them are the uh, geodetic positions. So these calibrated points no longer have state plane coordinates, they have local site coordinates. Now the great thing about creating a site calibration is that I can go both ways with this. So I'm gonna select these boundary uh, traverses. I'm gonna go into tools or file, export, and I'm gonna tell Traverse PC, I'll drag this over here for you, that I want to export those three selected traverses as KMZ, and I'm going to call these uh, South Devonshore Lots, KMZ. And let's export that. So we've written those three traverses out. Now let's go into Google Earth and let's open those up. So open. Here's our lots. Bring those in. Uh, Traverse PC brings those. In. Look what I've got now. I've got those lot lines plotted in relationship to these corners that I brought in from Google Earth and based on the calibration between those corners and my local site. So I've got everything in pretty good position here and I can see that the boundary is way back down here in this drainage. 
So the common area is just east of that. Okay, so that's the area I'm going to be looking at for the access. And then in this particular uh, planning process, we needed to identify where these houses were, and we may need to some topography in here to identify these breaks. We may need to locate some drain fields. So I want to get just some preliminary information back over in Traverse PC. And I want to show you what I did. I went ahead and said, okay, I'm going to trace out about where I see this break on Google Earth. And I'm going to do the same for those houses. Just trace them out with a polygon real quick. And let's send this back to Traverse PC based on that same site calibration. So I've got those in a subfolder called Export Features. Let's save that back. We're going to call that Export Features. Let's go back to Traverse PC now and just simply bring that in. So we're going to File, Import. Let's go ahead and find that file, Export Features, and import it. Now, because I've calibrated the site, Watch what happens when I tag these traverses. Here's my east break. Here's the house on lot 500, the house on lot 300, and the house on lot 400. So that's kind of the magic of site calibrations is that it's created the association between the geodetic positions from Google Earth and my local survey, local site coordinates. And I can go back and forth between Google Earth and Traverse PC, and the site calibration takes care of all the transformations necessary to put me in either coordinate system. And, and now I'm ready to finish this preliminary design or some layout information, turn that into the city, and um, if they go with this location, we'll be back out there with GPS, tie these things down a little bit better, and away we go. But what did I spend? You know, less than 10 minutes uh, doing the narrative for the video, probably half that time if I wasn't doing all the talking. Um, and Traverse PC made this super simple for me. Now, I'm using a Google Earth example here, but remember, this can be any kind of a static or dynamic GPS uh, with any kind of data collector you want. Create the calibration, use it as a site calibration, and now you've got your GPS data working seamlessly with your site, local site coordinates, if that's how you want to do your surveying. Okay. Uh, site Calibration, new in TPC Desktop, 2019. Okay, so calibrations are kind of like magic. Um, this is a common workflow anymore, uh, particularly where we're trying to bring in um, projects that we're working with ground uh, coordinates or a, a, a grid at ground, a local kind of grid, which is what a lot of projects are based on and we're trying to coordinate GPS or GNSS with that. Yeah, they look a lot like this, and, and actually Traverse PG kind of makes that fun to do uh, with that site calibration option. I, I can't imagine doing this w without Traverse PC. Um, I also want to show you in here that we've got calibration um, topics for photos, CAD, GNSS, total station. So what we just did with those geodetic positions from Google Earth, I could just as easily do with uh, positions from my GPS or GNSS receiver, uh, photos, uh, CAD, this is an interesting one. How many times do I get a CAD file for the project where the, the grid or coordinates in that CAD file are not the same as what I'm using in my survey? So I can create a calibration for importing that CAD into my survey so it ends up right where it's supposed to in my survey. And then if I do some work that I need to send back to the project, I export the CAD file with a reverse calibration. And I just name that. This is the calibration from this project to my survey. And when I send information back out, I just reverse it. They get that information just as it would have been if I had done it on their grid system. So those kinds of things are just kind of uh, pretty incredible. Um, and Coordinate reference systems is right at the heart of that. Okay, so it's 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 pretty cool. Let's come back to our outline here then, and uh, let's jump in right here. Understanding geodetic grid and ground positions, and I'm going to bring up a survey here that I've just used to create some diagrams so I can make sure we're all kind of on the same. 
page with this. So let's just talk a little bit about some of these terms. The project I just showed you, where I brought up that old survey, is one where we had taken the grid we're working with and we had put it up here at ground level. So we did everything on site. If I computed two coordinates and inverse between them, um, I could measure the, that on the ground and the whatever I measure on the ground would exactly equal that inverse. It's just straight trigonometric functions, pretty easy to work with. I can continue to work this way if I choose to. There's no reason unless the project requires it that I have to switch over to a state plane or UTM grid. I could continue working with the local grid just like this. Um, then of course we're talking about these grid projections where we're creating a state plane or UTM or low distortion grid and I've got it down below here but really depending on your scale factor um, it could be above or below that, um, that position depending on uh, what, what zone and what uh, projection you're in. And then we've got this geodetic uh, line here so this, these are computations on the ellipsoid and these are geodetic positions latitude, longitude, and height above the ellipsoid. So Traverse BC is, is comfortable working with all three of these and all three come into play when we talk about this coordinate reference system. So let's go ahead and bring up another one here. At issue and what we deal with a lot then is that if I'm dealing with a GPSS, GPS or GNSS, uh, anything geodetic and I'm doing these points on the ellipsoid, I'm projecting down to whatever my grid projection is, but I'm actually working up here at ground. And this ground distance is not the same as this grid distance here. So certainly Traverse BC has got all the tools here to say, okay, I know how to get from this here. Let's go ahead and pick something nice for that, that leader there. Do you know about this, where for the drawing I can come in and tell it how I want to draw those leaders? And then of course if I save this drawing as a template, all my templates will always show up that way. So now I get a nice leader line out of it. So Traverse BC is going to um, know how to factor from the projected grid to the, um, in this case, um, ellipsoid, if I'm doing geodetic there and then it knows how to get from there up to this point using the elevation factor or I can combine these two into what, what's called a combined factor and that's going to relate the ground distance between these two points one and two to the grid distance between those two one and one and two. So Traverse BC will take care of all that factoring for me. Just looking at my notes here real quick. Um, so geodetic positions latitude and longitude on, on the ellipsoid. Uh, the CRS takes care of the transformations from latitude and longitude to these projected coordinates based on the uh, datum and the projection and the ellipsoid that we've chosen there. And then um, we've recently added geoid modeling. So instead of assuming that mean sea level was the same as the uh, ellipsoid uh, surface, um, or just translating vertically to get them to match up. Uh, we now will compute the geoid separation at any geodetic position and from that we can relate ellipsoid height to elevation um, based on mean, mean sea level. So you can still continue to translate those heights up and down if you'd like or you can switch over to having Traverse PC uh, relate elevations with ellipsoid heights. Okay, so let's drop down and um, talk about coordinate reference system and kind of what all is involved and, and what that looks like here. Remember I said the coordinate reference system kind of puts everything together. So it equates geodetic positions and uh, grid projection coordinates. It uh, handles things like state plane, UTM, low distortion projections. Um, Traverse BC really makes all this transparent to us. We just 
pick a coordinate reference system, a project elevation, and off we go. So whether we're using GPS, GNSS, GIS, we can get the geodetic positions in GIS or Google Earth. It really doesn't matter. We just bring those positions in and Traverse BC generates coordinates for us. Or if we need to export um, information as geodetic, uh, we just compute the coordinates for us and the CRS does that in reverse, generates the um, geodetic positions for us. Inside the survey, what does this look like? So this particular survey that I brought up has a coordinate reference system and I can see that I pick a CRS file. Now this particular file is for NAD 83, the 2011 EPIC, but we've got the uh, reference systems for NAD 27, or UTM. Uh, these state ones, these are low distortion zones by state. And uh, we've got uh, a folder here you can put additional ones into. You can create your own. We provide the syntax file for these. They're pretty simple text files. And then this is kind of an interesting one. Um, Esri uh, can provide PRJ or projection files with their GIS data. And for the most part, those projection files completely define a CRS for Traverse PC. So I can go out to someplace like spatialreference.org, pull in whatever projection file I need and use it to define the coordinate reference system for a survey. Pretty, pretty flexible in that regard. But we can see here that once I pick the um, CRS type that I want to use, I can pick the zone, the ellipse data, I can pick a geoid if I want to do that geoid separation, and then I'm ready to go. Uh, I can also come over here and pick a project factor. And um, I don't know if we'll have a chance to look at computing an average today, but Traverse BC will actually uh, compute an average position for that project for you, including elevation. So here's the elevation factor and the grid factor, and I can tell it, put those together for me in the combined factor. And then I've got everything I need uh, ready to go to convert grid to ground using that combined factor. So kind of neat, uh, but again, I just kind of set these and then for the most part, I don't think about them again. So the coordinate reference system defines everything I need to go from geodetic positions to grid positions or grid positions to geodetic positions. And then with that project uh, location information and combined factor, I've got all the numbers I need to go from grid to ground or ground to grid. So it kind of wraps all that up in this one entity we call a uh, coordinate reference system. Okay, so, so far I've, I've really just been talking about coordinates, uh, geodetic positions, coordinates, whether they're grid or ground. Um, I want to switch over next to um, computations, geodetic and planar. And let me go ahead and bring this up. So when it comes to talking about computations, um, really the thing to get a, a handle on here is that computations can be done in Traverse PC both in geodetic and in planar. So we really don't care if you're working just entirely in geodesics on the ellipsoid or if you're computing uh, grid uh, or coordinate computations either down on a projected grid or on a local grid up here at ground level. Uh, Traverse PC does equally, does both equally as well. And I think probably the best way to kind of help you get a handle on it is do what we did earlier, is drop in and take a, a look at a short video that'll sort of give us a feel for um, what this is all about. So with your permission, I'm gonna go ahead and, and play this video and here's what I want you to, to pay attention to here. I want you to pay attention to distance type and direction type. How I'm telling Traverse PC to handle directions and how I'm telling Traverse PC to handle distances because that's, this is how I determine whether I'm doing geodetic or planar computations. Let's go ahead and listen to this video. Welcome to the TPC desktop video series on using geodetics. In this video, we're going to look at entering grid bearings and distances, or what we call grid data. And then we're going to take a look in a contrasting way how we enter geodetic uh, bearings and distances, or geodetic data. 
We've opened up the survey called Learn Geodetics. It's one of the sample files and we use it in the Geodetic Learning Guide. Let's go ahead and take a look at a traverse we've created here in the traverse view called East-West Grid Bearing. And um, we're going to take a look at the uh, northing and easting that we've entered here. And I'm going to swap over to a different drawing, which is that same grid east-west line. Let's open that up. And we can see that here we've created um, six points, each one about a mile apart. And we've basically gone due west on a grid. So we expect our coordinates to be the same. Let's open that traverse view back up in the northing. So all our northings are the same. But if we take a look at the latitudes, the latitudes change as we move farther west. And we expect that because the grid coordinates and the latitude uh, don't line up except at the principal meridian. Okay, so this is exactly what we expected to see here. I want to bring you in real quickly to the survey information and take a look at the fact that for this particular survey, we have a project elevation of 1,500 feet, and by and large, we want to work geodetically. So we want to use geodetic distance and true bearings. But we're going to override that in this traverse setting. I'm going to bring those up with the uh, button here for format view, and we're going to look at the advanced tab. And here, you can see that we've overridden three things. We said we're going to enter data in units of chains, not feet, which are the survey unit. We're going to enter distances at, as grid distance, and we're going to enter direction as grid bearing. So we just pick these from the list. Here's the bearings, here's the distances. And now these control how this traverse is computed. So I start then by entering either uh, coordinates for the first point or a geodetic position, doesn't really, really matter. Either one's okay. And then I enter grid, bearing, and distance. So here I've switched to display raw data. I used Shift F9, it's a toggle that goes back and forth. And I've said, show me the data that I've entered. Well, I can see that I started with coordinates for point one, and I've entered the rest of the uh, points by grid bearing and grid distance. So Traverse PC is going to compute coordinates based on that grid bearing and distance. And then from those coordinates, it's going to derive the latitude and longitude. So if I press Shift F9 to toggle back to the inverse mode again, I can see that now I have my latitude and longitude and the convergence for each one of those points. So just as I expect, since I entered all of these courses due west, my bearings show due west. And if I click back on the drawing, and I need to just switch this over real quick, so that it too is displaying grid bearings and distances. And we'll set this to show chains just like the traverse was. So now they're going to match up exactly. I now am displaying grid bearings and grid distances and chains for this traverse. And it exactly matches what I had in the traverse view. And I'll slide that up so we can see that these are the same. So if I'm not concerned about geodetics at all, and I just want to work with grid coordinates. And this is how I would enter that, that data. So let's make the quantum leap now into geodetics with Traverse PC. I'm going to close out that Traverse. I'm going to come back to a drawing called True East-West Line. And I'm going to go into the Traverses. And let's turn off this section area just for a moment here. And let's open a Traverse called East-West True Bearing and see what this looks like. Now, notice that we have turned off the columns for coordinates. So I don't even want to see the coordinates right now. I'm just going to work geodetically. In this particular traverse, I've entered latitude and longitude. And then I've entered the same data, the same values. My true bearings are 90 degrees west. My geodetic distance is 80 chains. But a geodetic distance is not the same as a grid distance. And a true bearing is not the same as a grid bearing. So I'm going to expect some differences, and we're going to talk about those here. So let's come in and look at the same things we looked at in the, the grid um, traverse earlier. Let's come up to our traverse format. Again, our units are in chains. But look at our distance and direction type now. From the distance list, we've chosen geodetic distance at project elevation. And for the direction, we've chosen true bearing at mean course convergence. So when I enter data, I'm going to be computing geodetic positions. Now, if I do a Shift F9 again, I can see that I'm starting with a latitude and longitude. So I'm starting with the geodetic position. I'm then entering geodetic bearings and distances. So Traverse PC is going to compute from those geodetic positions for each of those four sites. From those geodetic positions, then it can, if I want it to, derive the northing and easting coordinates. So let's Shift F9 to move back to uh, all the inverses. 
Anytime I want, I can choose Tools, Recompute. And I just went through and redid all the geodetic computations here. So now, let's drop out to our, our drawing. And here we see the geodetic line that runs on a true bearing east and west. Notice that it's not quite horizontal. It's not quite the same as a grid line. In fact, uh, if we were in this drawing and we said, let's look at that grid bearing traverse, our grid line does run horizontal east and west, but our true geodetic line uh, doesn't. Okay, this is exactly what we would expect based on where we're at on this uh, projection. In other words, we're east of the principal meridian, so I expect my uh, true west line to drift south. In other words, the, the bearings, grid bearings would change but the geodetic bearings stay the same, 90 degrees west. I want to drop back into the traverse view just for a moment, and I want to show you that if I highlight a true bearing and then look at the status bar at the bottom, it tells me the true bearing is based on the mean course convergence. If I had chosen a different option, and I said I want my direction to be based on um, a true bearing like uh, 2 degrees 30 minutes, okay, and let's put in um, 130. Okay, so now that's the value that it's based on. I could come back to Traverse PC and display a bearing, and do you see what it says now? This true bearing is based on a mapping angle of one, 1 degree 30 minutes. Same way with the distances. Let's click on a distance here, and I see that this is 80 chains based on the project elevation of 1500 feet. Let's change that. Let's go in and say, I want this to be a geodetic distance at the ellipsoid surface. So now when I highlight a, a geodetic distance, it tells me it's at the ellipsoid surface. Notice that the geodetic distance changed from 80 chains to 79.99. That's because it's currently still inversing between those geodetic positions, and at the ellipsoid surface, that distance of that geodesic is just slightly shorter than it is at a project elevation of 1500 feet. Had I entered the, the data with the ellipsoid surface already selected, I would have gotten this, Tools, Recompute. And Traverse PC now has recomputed those positions based on 80 chains at the ellipsoid surface. If I now were to switch back to a project elevation, like we had earlier, I'm basically going to see the reverse happen. Now these inverses at project elevation are slightly longer than the inverses at the ellipsoid surface. And again, I would correct that just by saying Tools, Recompute. So we can see that one of the cool things the Traverse View does is that it does two things at once for me. If I'm entering data, it uses that distance and that bearing to compute the foresight based on whatever distance and direction type I've selected. If I'm recalling existing survey points, whether they're geodetic positions or grid coordinates, it inverses between those based on the distance and direction type. So I can kind of have the best of both worlds here in one place. Let's look at one final thing here. I'm going to go back up to the distance and direction type, and let's go back to our true bearing based on mean course convergence, and let's switch to a geodetic distance based on mean course elevation. I want to talk about the fact that um, Traverse PC can do more rigorous computations if you ask it to. And notice that I've got 0.2002 here, or 202, at a 5,000 foot elevation. Okay, let's go ahead and do a Tools, Recompute. So I'm using 80 chains of geodetic distance between 201 and 202, but my elevation goes from 1,500 to 5,000 feet. I'm using 80 chains to the next point, but it drops back down to 1,500 feet. And just for the uh, heck of it here, we're going to increase the decimals the Traverse PC displays. Let's go to four decimal places. Let's open that Traverse back up again. Okay, so we're displaying greater distance here in the chains. And now let's switch back to one of these other distance types. Let's choose the ellipsoid surface here. And we expect to see some slight differences because I was using a mean elevation of the course when I computed that foresight. So if my elevations for another course are different, I expect to have a different distance. And in fact, we do. Notice that uh, 201 to 202 and 202 to 203 both are 79.9876 chains. 
Now when I drop back down to a constant elevation of 1500, I have a different distance, 79.9943. So again, the distance type and direction type allow me really to get at exactly what I wanted to compute or exactly what I want to show for inverses between the coordinates or the geodetic positions that I have. Okay, so you get to see there that this whole idea of distance and direction types are key to whether or not I'm working geodetically or, or planar. And, and let's just drop in and talk about this for a minute. We saw here that Traverse BC is comfortable doing straight geodetic computations. And, and in fact, in this diagram, I didn't even put a grid here. Because although Traverse BC can compute a coordinate for any um, geodetic position, it doesn't have to. The coordinate positions are not important, or they're not even part of the geodetic computations. Um, Thaddeus Vincenti uh, did a lot of work on geodetics uh, mid-70s. I think he published a lot of this in 1975 and it's actually perfect for computers. So we're actually doing forward computations with geodesics and geodetic inverses. So a, a geodesic is the shortest distance between two points on the ellipsoid, and that's what Traverse BC uh, computes. A, a lot of you, particularly if, as you work with the uh, public land survey system, are familiar with these true lines that have a bearing on one end, a different bearing on the other end, and we mean those bearings. Okay. Well, that, that meaning pretty much produces the same results as the inverses that uh, Thaddeus Vincenti uh, computed uh, in the mid-70s. So in um, 2010, when we were putting this together, I remember having some conversations with Bob Dahl, who was rewriting the BLM Manual of Instruction for 2009. And we had some long conversations about um, can I, can I get at what the PLSS does by using these geodetic computations? And the short answer is yes. Um, I, can, I can do latitudinal arcs. I can do true bearings. I can do um, uh, ground distance, just per the, like, like for the manual. And it, it turns out that that's exactly what I need to do for long distance pipeline projects or some road construction projects. Um, I don't typically run into this for a small boundary survey, but I do for other kinds of surveys that I work with. And, and basically, Traverse BC is going to hold these geodetic positions and use those geodetic positions to compute another geodetic position or to inverse between them. And it does all those computations on the ellipsoid. They're not direct computations, they're iterative. So we're glad to have a computer to get those done really, really fast. And you really don't even notice a speed difference in Traverse BC when you do these. What you notice is that it computes lats and longs just like it should. So really comfortable working inside of uh, geodetics inside of Traverse BC. Okay, let's switch over to planar computations. Of course, <coughs> these are what we're all familiar with. And uh, we talked about how I can do all these grid computations at ground with kind of a mean project elevation and everything I measure on the ground would equate directly to the inverses between coordinates. Or I can work with a grid like a state plane or a UTM or low distortion grid. And I, I know then I just have to be wary of or aware of that these are not ground distances. These are grid distances. So I need to convert or be mindful of what I have to do to get to ground distances when it actually comes to working with the actual project on the ground. And, and again, Traverse PC is really good at kind of putting all that together. And um, I don't know if we're going to talk about it at all today, but we've got a number of options, and you saw some in the video, for how to work with distances. I can have grid distances. I can have ground distances, which are basically grid distances expanded or contracted to ground, okay, depending uh, based on like a mean project elevation or mean course elevation or just a factor, combined factor that I want to put in. So it handles all that just fine. And then of course I just have to make a final decision about am I going to work with 
uh, grid bearings or do I need to apply a mapping angle to that uh, to get a like a uh, true bearing versus a grid bearing if I have issues with that. So Traverse PC has all those built in and I can switch over to this planar computation and go a million miles an hour. <clears throat> One thing kind of interesting about these um, planar computations and this distance type in particular, and I, I, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you know we do a, a double meridian distance, a DMD computation for areas. That's based on coordinates. So if I compute an area on the grid here, how do I get the right area on the ground from that? And I'm just going to tell you Traverse PC takes care of that. So when I apply a grid or a, a ground distance type to a traverse and go ahead and get the area for that, I get the ground area or the area up here at, at the site, not down here at the grid. It's kind of it's kind of fun. So in the uh, public land survey system, that whole thing about compass rule adjustment and apparent misclosure for areas and all that kind of stuff, it just disappears. It's not even a factor. And when Traverse BC does PLSS computations, I get an area at the ground period. And the same thing happens when I'm working in planar computations. Depending on the um, distance type that I've selected, if I choose a distance type at ground, the area I get is at ground. So a lot of that just kind of falls out. The same way when I produce a legal description. The distances in that legal description are at ground, not grid. Uh, same way when I do my uh, uh, curve and spiral computations. I'm dealing with the radius of that curve or spiral at the ground, not at the grid. So we've, we've made a lot of this just as transparent as we possibly could so you don't have to think about it. Yeah, it's very easy and we can take a look at this in um, any of the next webinars. It's very easy to compare what the grid distance and the ground distance are in a Kogo routine. And you go, oh, cool. of course, it's doing just what it should. So you can get some peace of mind real quick with that. Okay, give me just a moment to look over my notes again here. So let's come back to our outline here now. And uh, let's talk about CRS uh, coordinates. Um, or I probably should call this hybrid CRS coordinates. And let's take a look at what we're talking about here. Let me see if I can kind of lay this out for us. Um, Trimble, way back when, um, back in the 90s, uh, said, I'm going to take a plane and I'm going to put it on the surface of the Earth and I'm going to define one point that's normal to that plane and I'm going to do grid computations on that plane and call it good. Okay, And they were a big dog and that's kind of how it worked and, and so basically what they did, they took this coordinate reference system grid and they brought it from where it was up to the surface just like we've been talking about local site grids. So basically they were doing planar computations on a local grid defined perpendicular to one point. Okay, they went down through, remember they do their earth centered, earth fixed computations? Okay, so perpendicular to this earth centered, earth fixed um, direction, and every all the computations were, were planar. Um, so we all agree that some physical point on the ground is some XYZ with some basis of bearing. Okay. Uh, this doesn't change the configuration and dimensions of the uh, grid points, so we call that conformal. Um, and Traverse BC, uh, by default, does conformal transformations in those site calibrations or those calibrations. So we're not changing the relationship angle-wise between points. If one line is twice as long as a line before the calibration, after the calibration, it's twice as long as that line. Of course, their line lengths have changed, but the relationship hasn't. It's a conformal relationship. And, and basically what this allows us to say is ground equals design. So I can design everything at the ground, and that's great for construction. Um, geodetic and the coordinate positions relate well here. There is some error, but we can calibrate it out. So Google Earth works well for this. GIS works well for this. and um, Within a certain area, I can 
assume that the grid coordinates on this CRS hybrid grid are going to line up with geodetic positions. Now, if I extend out too far, I'm going to lose that. I'm going to have greater error. And I'm going to have to do something different. But for a small project, I can do it. So this is great for uh, RTK. A lot of you work with virtual reference stations or continuing operation um, stations cores. Um, and you can collect in real time, do stakeout coordinates. It's good for any terrestrial stuff. So you go out there with your robotic total station and turn an angle. It's going to put you in the right direction. You measure a distance. It's going to be the right distance out. And it's good for, for mixing uh, GPS and terrestrial type observations. So I can be out there in the same project with GPS, with total stations, and it, it all kind of works. So, so we tend to do a fair amount of this still. And um, if I have a project that the county, for instance, wants me to use state plane coordinates, I'm, I'm really likely to do this. I'm likely to pick a state plane grid and really think of it at ground. Um, so my design is the same as, as ground. And I'm really not worried then about converting grid to ground okay? um, for, that, for that, that project, because it's a small enough project. If I have a bigger project, sometimes I have to work in state plane coordinates, and I do then have to convert grid to ground for reporting and for whatever else I need, I need to do. So I want you to kind of know then that this is a, a hybrid situation, fits right in with the low distortion um, uh, projections that we see in, for the different states and counties and uh, road corridors. And, and Traverse BC is comfortable doing this uh, as, as it is doing other types of projections. Okay, so let's come back to our outline and just sort of wrap it up. Uh, remember I said in this CRS part one, I was going to cast a pretty wide net. I, I wanted you to get a handle on the fact that we can deal with a geodetic grid and ground coordinates. We can deal with geodetic computations and planar computations. And all of that happens in Traverse BC based on the coordinate reference system that we choose and the distance and direction types that we choose. So, uh, and, and then it pretty much happens transparently. So really kind of whatever, whatever direction you need to go with your coordinate system, uh, you can do that in Traverse BC. Uh, we've got some great workflows like that site calibration to sort of take the busy work out of it. And, and I think actually make it kind of fun. Um, and, and then we've got all the tools to, to work between grid and ground, uh, areas, legal descriptions, COGO routines, all that, that sort of thing. Um, and you'll learn pretty quick that Traverse BC continues to compute coordinates on whatever grid the survey is in. And then you can turn right around and get grid distances from those or ground distances from those, depending on how you've set up your coordinate reference system. OK, so when you do your CEU requests, there'll be a spot there you can uh, put in some requests or what else you'd like to see. And we'll use that to sort of determine what we're going to talk about in April with our CRS Part 2 and uh, whether or not we do a May seminar on coordinate reference systems. Um, but I'm anticipating at this point we'll come back and we'll look specifically at grid to ground. We'll take a look at specifically at that project location and using that average point. And then we'll drop into some COGO and some reports and talk about how they um, change with depending on which coordinate reference system we, we've selected. So a lot more detail in depth with those. Uh, this was just kind of a, an overview. OK, thank you for joining us today. Hope you uh, learned some more about how Traverse BC works with coordinate reference systems.